Hello and welcome. Now in this video, I'll show you how to write a top level nine response to a Jane Eyre extract question. Bear in mind that this model answer as well as other Jane Eyre model answers can be downloaded as part of this course. So just follow the link, sign up and download this straight away. I'll begin by reading this passage, which is taken from chapter five of the novel. I'll then go over with you a model answer and show you why it would get a level nine. So let's get started. Now let's begin by reading through this extract. Though I'd now extinguished my candle and was laid down in bed, I could not sleep for thinking of his look when he paused in the avenue and told how his destiny had risen up before him and dared him to be happy at Thornfield. Why not? I asked myself. What alienates him from the house? Will he leave it again soon? Mrs. Fairfax said he seldom stayed here longer than a fortnight at a time and he has now been resident eight weeks. If he does go, the change will be doleful. Suppose he should be absent, spring, summer and autumn, how joyless sunshine and fine days will seem. I hardly know whether I had slept or not after this musing. At any rate, I started wide awake on hearing a vague murmur, peculiar and lugubrious, which sounded, I thought, just above me. I wish I had kept my candle burning. The night was drearily dark. My spirits were depressed. I rose and sat up in bed listening. The sound was hushed. I tried again to sleep, but my heart beat anxiously. My inward tranquility was broken. The clock, far down in the hall, struck two. Just then, it seemed my chamber door was touched as if fingers had swept the panels in a groping way along the dark gallery outside. I said, who's there? Nothing answered. I was chilled with fear. All at once, I remembered it might be Pilot, who, when the kitchen door chanced to be left open, not unfrequently found his way up to the threshold of Mr. Rochester's chamber. I had seen him lying there myself in the mornings. The idea calmed me somewhat. I lay down. Silence composes the nerves, and as an unbroken hush now reigned again through the whole house, I began to feel the return of slumber, but it was not fated that I should sleep that night. A dream had scarcely approached my ear when it fled, affrighted, scared by a marrow freezing instant enough. There was a demonic laugh, low, suppressed and deep, uttered as it seemed at the very keyhole of my chamber door. The head of my bed was near the door, and I thought at first the goblin laughter stood at my bedside, or rather crouched by my pillow, but I rose, looked around, and could see nothing, while as I still gazed and the unnatural sound was reiterated, and I knew it came from behind the panels. My first impulse was to rise and fasten the bolt, my next again to cry out, Who's there? Something gurgled and moaned. Ere long, steps retreated up the gallery towards a third story staircase. A door had lately been made to shut in that staircase. I heard it open and close, and all was still. Was that Grace Paul? And is she possessed with the devil? thought I. Impossible now to remain longer by myself. I must go to Mrs. Fairfax. I hurried on my frock and shawl. I withdrew the bolt and opened the door with a trembling hand. There was a candle burning just outside and on the matting in the gallery. I was surprised at this circumstance, but still more was I amazed to perceive the air quite dim as if filled by smoke. And while looking to the right hand and left to find whence these blue wreaths issued, I became further aware of a strong smell of burning. Something creaked. It was a door ajar, and that door was Mr. Rochester's, and the smoke rushed in a cloud from thence. I thought no more of Mrs. Fairfax. I thought no more of Grace Paul or the laugh. In an instant, I was within the chamber. Tongues of flame darted around the bed. The curtains were on fire. In the midst of blaze and vapour, Mr. Rochester lay stretched motionless in deep sleep. Wake, wake, I cried. I shook him, but he only murmured and turned. The smoke had stupefied him. Not a moment could be lost. The very sheets were kindling. I rushed to his basin and ewer. Fortunately, one was wide and the other deep, and both were filled with water. I heaped them up, deluged the bed and its occupant, flew back to my own room, 
brought my own water jug, baptized the couch afresh, and, by God's aid, succeeded in extinguishing the flames which were devouring it. The hiss of the quenched element, the breakage of a pitcher which I flung from my hand when I had emptied it, and above all, the splash of the shower bath I had liberally bestowed, roused Mr. Rochester at last. Though it was now dark, I knew he was awake, because I heard him fulminating strange anathemas at finding himself lying in a pool of water. Is there a flood? he cried. No, sir, I answered. But there has been a fire. Get up, do. You are quenched now. I will fetch you a candle. In the name of all elves in Christendom. Is that Jane Eyre? he demanded. What have you done with me, witch sorceress? Who's in the room besides you? Have you plotted to drown me? I'll fetch you a candle, sir, and in heaven's name get up. Somebody has plotted something. You cannot too soon find out who and what it is. There, I'm up now, but at your peril you fetch a candle yet. Wait two minutes till I get into some dry garments, and if dr any dry there be, yes, here's my dressing gown. Now run. I did run. I brought the candle, which still remained in the gallery. He took it from my hand, held it up, and surveyed the bed, all blackened and scorched, the sheets drenched in the carpet round it, swimming in water. What is it, and who did it? he asked. I briefly related to him what had transpired, the strange laugh I'd heard in the gallery, the step ascending to the third storey, the smoke, the smell of fire which had conducted me to his room, in what state I'd found matters there, and how I delodged him with all the water I could lay hands on. Now, the question asks for this paper, in what ways does Bronte make this a dramatic moment in the novel? Now, just to recap, essentially what happens in this part of the novel is Jane Eyre hears these animalistic laughs and uh, she is unable to sleep. And once she leaves her room, she essentially finds that there's been a fire started and the main source of the fire is Mr. Rochester's room. And of course, here we can see that she saves his life. And if you do read to the end of the novel, we realize that this is Bertha Mason who had attempted to kill her husband. Okay. So now we've read this extract, let's look at how to answer a really top level nine response when it comes to writing about how this point in the story is a dramatic moment in the novel. Now, before you begin answering this question, I would always suggest when you look at the question, highlight the key words in the question. In other words, the main part of the question that you need to focus your answer on. Now, I would suggest that the keywords are really how this is what we call a dramatic moment in the novel. So, of course, your answer needs to address these keywords. Now, when it comes to writing the essay, always remember you want to start with an introduction. So you can see here the introductory paragraph. And this is just generally you talking about and summarizing what may have happened in the extract, but equally justifying how this is a dramatic moment. And also don't forget when you're answering a question, try to also finish with a conclusion. But to be honest, a conclusion and introduction in terms of wording can be very similar. So let's look at an introduction to this question. Bronte presents this moment as dramatic in the novel, as this is the first major exchange that we see between Jane Eyre and Mr. Rochester. In this part of the novel, Jane feels an intense fear, which leads her to leave her room and discover a fire in Mr. Rochester's room. She's able to save Mr. Rochester. However, he initially reacts violently towards her, which shocks and surprises us as readers. In this moment in the novel, we as readers notice there's a sharp contrast between Jane Eyre's nature, which is presented as angelic, as she saves his life. Yet Mr. Rochester's violent language, which he accuses her of devilish deeds, presents him as a sinner in need of saving. Whilst Jane Eyre is depicted by Bronte in this extract as forgiving yet assertive, Mr. Rochester is shown to be paranoid and fearful of the deceptive nature which he sees in women. Hence, he accuses Jane mistakenly. This dramatic moment captivates and intrigues us as readers. So as you can see here, I've mentioned that this is a dramatic moment in the novel. I've even closed by talking about how this is dramatic because what you're doing here, when you mention how it's dramatic, you are indicating to your examiner or to your teacher who's looking at this essay that you're answering it directly. 
Again, as you can see here, what I've began by doing in the introduction is quickly summarizing what Jane finds. But what you don't want your introduction to be is just basically a long summary of what's happened in the extract because you still want to talk about and link it to how we as readers feel. And of course, what I've then elaborated on is the two contrasting reactions. Firstly, Jane, she is really quick to save Mr. Rochester. So in some ways, she's her, his savior. Whilst Mr. Rochester, the way he's really paranoid, maybe shows that he's hiding some kind of sin, okay? So really your introduction, the main function of your introduction is to show in what way you agree with the question, and you always agree with the question, but also summarizing and summing up what has happened and briefly alluding to how this makes us as readers feel. But don't spend too long on your introduction because that's just the icing on the cake. You want to go into the details in more specific information, okay? So let's look at the first paragraph. The opening of the extract begins by Jane sensing that something is amiss in her room, which creates a feeling of tension and anticipation in the novel. Jane feels uneasy as she started wide awake on hearing a vague murmur, peculiar and lugubrious, and Bronte uses pathetic fallacy as she describes just how dark Jane's room is, as she wished I had kept my candle burning, the night was drearily dark. Bronte contrasts the imagery of light and darkness through contrasting the candle with a dark night, and this creates a sense of anticipation and dread within the reader. Perhaps Bronte's contrast of these two opposing elements symbolizes Jane as being a light as well as a savior to others. However, it contrasts the darkness which Mr. Rochester feels as well as his dark secret, which is his mad wife that he tries to hide away. Moreover, Bronte's use of onomatopoeia to describe a murmur as is an allusion to Bertha. And this creates a sense of uncertainty and curiosity within the reader as they are yet to discover who Bertha is. Thus the murmur makes us as readers curious to discover the voice. This opening is a dramatic opening as it creates a feeling of mystery as well as a terrible sense of foreboding within the reader. Now here, I would suggest that this opening paragraph is really, really strong and I'll show you why. So firstly, Always begin your answer by making a point. Point means that you're relating it directly back to the question. Now, I'll give it a color code, okay? So I'll highlight point as yellow, okay? Then, you then want to include your evidence, okay? So point, then followed by evidence, which I'm gonna give it a blue color. Now here, you then want to explain, and this is essentially part of analysis, okay? Now, when you're analyzing, this is really where the bulk of marks come. This is, analysis essentially relates to the parts of the story that you're not told directly. This is you kind of thinking, okay, if the author uses this language, okay, so of course here, I'm referring to specific use of language of candle and night from my evidence. What does this mean? This contrast, as I've mentioned here in the analysis, her being a light as well as a savior in contrast to the darkness that Mr. Rochester represents. Also actually part of my analysis here is a language technique. And this language technique that's used, so I'm gonna put this as part of pink, is onomatopoeia, okay? So essentially, Bronte uses onomatopoeia. Then of course, you want to link this back to the question, which I'm gonna put in green, okay? So firstly, just to recap, you always want to make your point, linking it back to the question and talking about why this could be a really dramatic moment. But also actually what I'm showing is I'm starting with uh, discussing some evidence from the opening of the extract, okay? So I'm indicating to my examiner, okay, I'm gonna work through this. So I'm gonna take something from the opening that therefore means, of course, my following paragraphs should be taken from the middle and then from the end, okay? Then I follow with evidence directly, so as you can see here in blue. Then I really start picking apart this evidence and analysing it, and this is which uh, this is where I've highlighted it in pink, so this is your explanation, your analysis, okay? And of course, part of your explanation and analysis is thinking about reader's response. And also another element of explanation and analysis is talking about techniques, as you can see here, I've mentioned onomatopoeia, then you link this back to the question, as, as you can see here, I've mentioned this idea of it being really dramatic, okay? So hopefully you can see the keywords that are used here. So let's look at the second paragraph. The sense of drama increases as Jane hears what sounds like a devilish creature near her room. She notices that 
there was a demoniac laugh, low, suppressed and deep. And Bronte uses the rule of three to describe how the laugh sounds low, suppressed and deep. Although at this point in the novel, we as readers do not know that it is the laughter of Bertha, we are terrified as a person whose laughing is described in animalistic terms. Moreover, the reference to the laugh as being devilish and demoniac is powerful as it heightens the sense of drama and increases the pace of the passage. The atmosphere becomes intensely filled with tension and panic, which is reflected in Jane's actions as she crouched by my pillow, but I rose, looked around and could see nothing. Bronte makes this moment powerful and dramatic as this presentation of Bertha as being animalistic and unrestrained contextually went against what was expected of Victorian women. Contextually, Victorian women were expected to be submissive and obedient towards their husband. They were expected to be the angels of the house, quiet, restrained and passive. Yet Bertha, who goes against this, is used to portray Victorian fears of an unrestrained women. This moment is thus made dramatic as Bronte uses this as a way to play up to Victorian fears of unrestrained women, who many men believed could ultimately become driven to madness if their passions were unrestrained. Thus, this depiction of Bertha, even if we at this point in the novel do not quite know it as her, is dramatic as it heightens our fears and we can see that Bronte depicts her as a savage being given she is possessed by her emotions. Now, as you can see, this paragraph is much longer than this other one, and hopefully you've picked up on why. It's because I've mentioned context, okay? Now, one thing to bear in mind is when it comes to something like context, you don't have to mention it for every single paragraph. You only mention it where relevant, but of course, you do need to include contextual information. Even if it's just one paragraph within your essay, context, again, really, really dramatically boosts your marks. Now, let's look at why this paragraph is also really, really strong. And also you will see that the structure is somewhat slightly different to this. Of course, you still have the point, evidence, uh, explanation, which is part of analysis and then linking back. However, this is kind of slightly different in this paragraph because firstly, I start with my point. So again, I'm going to highlight this in yellow. Then I talk about some evidence. So I add my first set of evidence here. Okay. Then... I then start with a little bit of explanation, okay? So I start explaining this demoniac laugh. So you're gonna see here a little bit of explanation. Then as part of my explanation, I kind of develop that a little bit more and talk about how this is affecting the atmosphere. You're gonna see this also here. However, I then add another bit of evidence, okay? So you can see this point, then evidence, then a little bit of explanation, and a bit more of evidence just to strengthen my point, then more explanation. Now this explanation encompasses, it adds the contextual point, which is really, really, really important, okay? So part of the explanation can include context, as you can see here, how this uh, part of the passage really goes against how Victorian women were expected to be. Then of course, I have a really, really long link back to the Point, okay or rather back to the question why thus this moment is really really dramatic so this thing is fairly long because I'm also trying to include it and relate it back to the point I've made about context okay so as I mentioned context is very important it's crucial you don't have to add context in every single paragraph as you can see this paragraph is really strong however you do need to have at least one context point in your essay if you're aiming for a level nine or at least a level eight, okay? So this is in the A grade territory. You will not be hitting this level if you don't include context. Of course, also, as you can see, I've talked about, for instance, rule of three, which is a language technique. And again, there's also lots of analysis relating to how this makes us feel, okay? So let's move on to the next paragraph. As the extract progresses, the passage becomes extremely dramatic when Jane discovers the fire in Mr. Rochester's room. Bronte makes this moment in the novel dramatic through the reference of heaven and hell when Jane discovers the fire. She watched the tongues of flames as they darted around the bed. We can see that Mr. Rochester is surrounded by fire as he lay motionless in deep sleep. Bronte effectively uses the metaphor tongues of flames to connote the idea of hell consuming Mr. Rochester's room. Moreover, the personification darted creates explicit imagery of demons dancing around his room. 
This personification reveals how swiftly the flames grow, creating a terrible sense of destruction. It indicates a sense of danger to the readers, which makes this moment horrifying as we are worried that Mr. Rochester may have already been killed by the flames of the fumes. The hellish imagery that is used to describe the fire is powerful as contextually it connotes the religious idea of going to hell. Victorians were highly religious and there was a Christian perspective that sin always led to death and punishment in hell where there was fire and brimstone. This illustrates how Mr. Rochester is symbolically shown as having committed sins, hence the hellish language reveals that he is being punished by God for his sinful past actions. This indeed foreshadows the eventual burning of Thornfield Hall by Bertha later in the novel, whereby Mr. Rochester is punished for his sins of being unfaithful to Bertha with his French mistress, as well as attempting to marry Jane. He is punished with blindness as well as disability once Thornfield is burnt down. Hence, this depiction of him being surrounded by flames illustrates the idea that he is filled with sin and he faces the risk of punishment from God for his sins. Now again, here, this paragraph is really strong, but also it's fairly lengthy because I've added another contextual point and this one is relating to religion. Now, as you can see here, I open with a fairly long point, okay? Usually my points have been just one sentence, two sentences, but as you can see here, it's three sentences. And of course, I'm mentioning this idea of how this is dramatic. And as you can see here, I've then added evidence, okay? So two separate bits of evidence, which I'm going to highlight in blue. Then I've explained and talked about techniques that Bronte uses and then linked this to... Uh, elsewhere in the story okay and of course also I've linked it to context okay so as you can see here there's a lot of analysis that I've done and as I mentioned I've used words like how this uh, use of metaphor is really powerful the use of personification this is technique and this relates again if you remember the question how, in what ways in other words how Bonte makes this dramatic moment uh, of course, you want to talk about the use of metaphor and personification to really heighten the sense of drama. Then, as you can see here, there's lots of context relating to religion and how she, Bronte, cleverly uses this in order to show Mr. Rochester, maybe and even to foreshadow how Thornfield Hall is burnt down. And of course, I've then linked it back to how uh, this foreshadows Thornfield Hall eventually being burnt down, him being punished for his sins. And we can see maybe as readers that perhaps Mr. Rochester is not as blameless as we believe. So then linked it back to the question and also linked it to elsewhere in the novel. OK, you're not expected for this kind of extract question to uh, talk too much about elsewhere in the novel. But if you can, you do get extra points for that. OK, so as I mentioned, this paragraph is fairly detailed. There's lots relating to context. Also, there's links to elsewhere in the novel. However, all of this just strengthens your response. OK, let's look at the next uh, part of the essay. The dramatic moment reaches a climax when Jane saves Mr. Rochester's life. And this moment appears extremely captivating to us as readers because in contrast to Mr. Rochester, who's presented as sinful, Jane appears to be a pure messianic figure who attempts to save him. She entered his room as baptized his couch and she extinguished the flames which were devouring it. Moreover, she tells Mr. Rochester, in heaven's name, get up. Bronte uses language belonging to the semantic field of religion as a reference to how she baptised the room as well as her call to heaven, illustrates Jane's purity as well as the key role she plays in the novel as a saviour. Jane is depicted as pure, yet Mr Rochester ironically calls her a sorceress, illustrating how paranoid he is by darkness as he's sinful, whilst she works to bring light and purity into his life. Jane's saving of Mr. Rochester foreshadows how she eventually saves him from a life of melancholy and depression at the end of the novel when she agrees to marry him. Jane illustrates the theme of redemption as she teaches Mr. Rochester the Christian virtues of morality. Indeed, a Christian morals overpowers his sense of darkness and loss. Jane is used as a figure who teaches Mr. Rochester the importance of morality and virtue as well as the importance of forgiveness. Hence, she is used as an angelic figure who teaches him to embrace Christian purity and virtues. This makes this moment incredibly dramatic for us as readers. Again, hopefully you've noticed also with the different points, I've also signposted, you know, for example, with my first paragraph, I've talked about the opening, then I mentioned, uh, you know, as the passage progresses, then I've mentioned again as the extract progresses. Now here, I also open the point with uh, ref referring to another part 
of the uh, extract. Okay, so I begin my point talking about how it reaches this climax, the scariest part of it. Then I've added evidence here. And uh, again, I've used two separate bits of evidence when she uh, tells him to get up in heaven's name and also the flames, a description of the flames that are devouring his room. OK, so you can see that here. Then, of course, I've talked about uh, the semantic field of religion. So this is a language point, which is very important. Then as part of this, uh, I've analysed it and talked about how there's some irony, because even if Mr. Rochester calls her sorceress, actually, uh, Jane Eyre is very, very powerful in terms of showing these Christian virtues, these Christian ideals of morality, and Bronte illustrates this massive contrast between the two characters. And of course, I've linked it back to the question, and hence also talked about why this is so dramatic. But equally, as you will notice, I've talked about elsewhere in the novel, talking about how the way Jane saves him from these flames foreshadows how she eventually saves him, marries him, even if he is disabled later on in the novel. So let's look at the conclusion. And as I mentioned, conclusion, you don't have to spend too much time on it. However, in a really strong essay, it's always good practice to open with an introduction and to close by just closing the conclusion and closing your discussion. Now let's look at the conclusion. To conclude, Bronte's depiction of this major incident in Mr. Rochester's home, Thornfield Hall, as well as the relationship between Mr. Rochester and Jane Eyre, makes this a dramatic moment in the novel. This passage illustrates the idea of heaven and hell, symbolised through both Mr. Rochester's sinful, paranoid nature, as opposed to Jane's pure, forgiving ideals which enable her to save him. This extract is powerful in illustrating the ideas that Victorians associated with virtue, as it relates to women being angels of the house, as well as the Christian virtue within both men and women. Jane is used as a contrast to Bertha. Whilst Bertha is given over to her passions and desires, which turn her into a mad and destructive person, Jane's proximity to her Christian virtues makes her an admirable character. This incident signals a turning point in her relationship with Mr. Rochester, whom she influences to become a better person that eventually atones for his sins. Okay, so now, as you can see here with the conclusion, what I've done is really sum up what's happened and, of course, also summed up how Jane's character in the extract is used to contrast Mr. Rochester's character, but equally how her character is used to contrast uh, Bertha Mason's character. She is the composite Victorian woman, whilst Bertha Mason is shown as someone who didn't follow Victorian ideals. That's probably why she went crazy. And of course, I've then linked it to how this extract is really dramatic in the novel. So as I've mentioned before, all of these notes can be downloaded as part of the course. Do follow the link below in order to get access to this as well as lots of other model answers. I hope you've learned something new and thank you so much for listening.